Hey everyone, Foxtrot here with Virtual Carrier Task Force 58. Welcome to this full tutorial on the radio navigation system in Magnitude 3's F4U Corsair for DCS World. Today we'll dive into the history of the YEZB homing system, how Magnitude 3 has implemented this in the sim, what they got right and wrong, and how you can set up and use this powerful tool both in single player and multiplayer missions. The YEZB homing system was a critical innovation in U.S. Navy carrier operations during World War II. The system allowed pilots to locate their carrier task group even after long-range strikes or chaotic air battles, when navigation by visual reference or dead reckoning was no longer reliable. YE referred to the carrier-based transmitter, while ZB referred to the aircraft-mounted receiver. In the Corsair, this worked by transmitting a rotational directional radio beam from the carrier, sweeping the horizon in 30 degree sectors. Pilots would tune their radios to the carrier's frequency and listen for Morse code letters that indicated what sector of the beam they were receiving. This was not a precise instrument landing system. It was a homing aid, helping pilots find their way back over vast, featureless oceans, especially when visibility was poor or the carrier had moved from its original position. In DCS, Magnitude 3 has modeled this system in the F4U Corsair, and it's functional, with a few caveats we'll discuss later. Here's how to operate it. First, turn the ANARR2 receiver on using the Rectifier C MHF switch on the C38 control unit. In the simulation, the vacuum tubes will take approximately 5 seconds to heat up. Tune your radio to the desired preset channel. In this case, I'm using channel 1, which is for the carrier. The preset channel mode operation is controlled by the C38 control unit. To turn channel mode on, set the CW voice switch to voice. Due to a quirk in the current model, this is necessary to hear the Morse code. Now you'll hear two parts of Morse code. Every 30 seconds, you will first hear the identifier of the carrier. In this case, the carrier is identified by C, V. Then, the sector letter, which tells you which pie slice of the carrier's beam you're receiving. In this case, we're hearing S, which puts us roughly at 345 degrees from the carrier. Now that we know our position, we need to make a heading of 165 degrees to go to the carrier. This heading is opposite the direction of the letter we are receiving because at the center of the circle diagram is the carrier's location. Now that we're heading in the right direction, we either stay on this course or, if we begin to hear a new letter, alter our course to continue homing in on the fleet. In the real system, the pi sectors were offset by 15 degrees compared to the one we received by magnitude 3. This means you'll often need to split the difference between 30 degree headings to fly accurately. On the compass card, you will notice that all 30 degree increments are in bold. This would go hand in hand with your radio navigation, since you would simply place the needle on the correct heading or the larger number. However, for now, we have to split the difference. The radio navigation system still works as intended, however it is not historically modeled the way the original system was designed. Now we are beginning to hear the letter L. This means we need to alter our course to 195 degrees, the reverse of our current position. If you hear alternating letters, say S and L, you're nearing the boundary between these sectors and may need to correct course or you are nearing the fleet depending on the rate of change. Now that we've gotten within visual range of the carrier fleet, we can begin our descent and make our approach to land. The fleet has been keeping track of my position since I remembered to keep my IFF turned on. I may not have direct communication with the fleet, but they at least know that I'm friendly and intend to land. Now that we have a practical understanding of how the radio navigation system functions, let's have a look at how to set this system up in the mission editor. 
All right, so here's how to properly set up the radio navigation system for a mission. Starting with the carrier, assign the carrier's frequency as desired. Mine will be on 124 megahertz AM to make this easy. Only one carrier should transmit radio homing to avoid overlap of transmissions. Set up the unit name as desired. Only the first three letters are transmitted as the identifier. In this example, I've changed the unit name to CV. To set up your Corsair, assign the ARR2 navigation preset to match the carrier frequency. In this case, I'm going to keep preset channel 1 at 124 MHz AM. If done correctly, your Corsair will receive the designated carrier's radio homing signal. There are a few suggestions that would improve this system in the sim. Allowing players to change the letters for each sector in the radio nav diagram would combat certain exploits in multiplayer scenarios. It would also create more of a purpose and need to have this information either available on the kneeboard or potentially on the plotting board. I would also recommend adding an optional on-screen display of the received letter, but for those DCS hardcore players, that might make it a little too easy. I would also recommend implementing the proper 15 degree offset to correctly match the original YEZB homing system. Another suggestion would also to include a kneeboard radio nav chart in the base aircraft. Currently, players have to download user created charts or make their own. In conclusion, the YEZB homing system was a vital tool for World War II carrier pilots. Magnitude 3's implementation in the F4U Corsair and DCS is good, with room for some historical accuracy improvements. Once you understand how to use it, it becomes an essential skill for flying realistic naval missions over the vast ocean landscapes. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. If you'd like more in-depth breakdowns of World War II era systems, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.